It is being called a king's ransom. The Canadian delegation to the funeral for Queen Elizabeth II cost taxpayers close to $400,000 in hotel rooms. Now to talk about this in more detail is our political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly joining us once again from Toronto. Brian, one of the rooms was right around $6,000 a night. Do we know who stayed in that room and was it at Buckingham Palace? Uh, no, Buckingham Palace would be free for the most part. <laughs> this was at a place called the Corinthia Hotel, which a lot of Canadians hadn't heard of until they saw Justin Trudeau singing Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody at the hotel lobby, um, you know, as uh, one of the, the guests on the delegation played the piano. But the Corinthia is one of the most expensive hotels in that section of London around Trafalgar Square. And the $6,000 a room night, it's 4,800 pounds, Given the exchange rate that the uh, government of Canada was using and the documents they released to me, that works out to about $6,086 a night, I believe. But don't worry, Hal, it comes with complimentary butler service and views of the, the Thames River. So it's completely worth it. One thing they won't tell us, who was staying in the room. Now, I initially thought, well, it had to be the governor general. She would be the lead of the delegation, the most senior person. Well, if it was the governor general and not the prime minister, which a lot of Canadians would automatically assume, you'd think the prime minister's office might let that slip. They're refusing to release the information of who stayed in the room. So maybe it is Justin Trudeau, or maybe they just know that whether it's Mary Simon, the governor general, or Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, this is going to look bad on the government. Because we can all understand that the prime minister is not going to stay at the Hamptons by Hilton out by the Stansted Airport an hour away. That's where they sent the support staff to stay, by the way. They're not going to stay there. They're going to be in a downtown hotel. But did it have to be this one? Did it have to be this five-star hotel, one of the most expensive in the city? Did they have to charge a $6,000 a night room charge? Or could they all have stayed in the $2,000 a night rooms? By the way, when I compared all of the hotels around Trafalgar Square area, where the, the Canadian um, diplomatic mission is at Canada House, there were more than 20 five-star hotels within a kilometer. This was by far the most expensive one. That's where we stayed. And it's just mind-boggling that we paid that much for just for hotel rooms. All in the taxpayer's dime. Brian, and all of this comes at a time when Canadians are dealing with an affordability crisis and high inflation. Does this make the Trudeau Liberals really look out of touch? I think it makes them look completely out of touch. You know, Canadians are, are, are seeing the inflation numbers every month and worried about the cost of food, food inflation over 10%. And, and then the prime minister and his entourage are spending $400,000 on hotel rooms for the Queen's funeral. As I said, we all expected it would be expensive, but this seems completely out of touch. Could they not have stayed at a four-star hotel in London? Which, by the way, a four-star hotel in London is going to be better than pretty much any hotel that they stay at when they travel in Canada. So, you know, that's not to knock our hotels. We've got some beautiful, lovely hotels across this country in every part. But, you know, I, I've traveled in some fancy circles at times due to my job. I've never stayed in a $6,000 a night room. I'm not sure what one would look like. Uh, but everything about this screams, we're not paying attention to the taxpayers. We're not paying attention to what Canadians are going through. We're just living our best life, and you're paying for it. You know, I think one of the nicest hotel rooms I've stayed at was the Banff Springs Hotel and the stunning view of the Rockies. And I'll tell you, it was nowhere near $6,000 <laughs> a night. Brian, the federal Conservatives were recently running radio ads in Newfoundland ahead of a vote in the House of Commons on making home heating more affordable. What do you think is the strategy here? This was a very specific strategy. So on Monday, there was a, a vote on a Conservative Party motion on not putting up the cost of home heating fuel by not putting the carbon tax on home heating, heating fuel, so exempting it. They were running ads in Newfoundland for a couple of reasons. One, the Liberal Premier there, Andrew Fury, he's put out a letter to the Prime Minister and his Environment Minister about a month ago saying, look, you can't increase the carbon tax on April 1st. Newfoundland has a long heat, home heating season, right? It, it doesn't start in mid-November and end in mid-March. You know, it, it's not Florida. It starts in September and ends in uh, late May. So yeah, April 1st, it goes up. 
Fury has pointed out that people are already feeling the pinch. People are headed towards energy poverty. He says it would have devastating impacts. And look, he and he also detailed that he's trying to get people off of home heating fuels like oil. I don't know if you've ever heated with oil, Hal. It is incredibly expensive. And I remember living in a rural area, heating my home with oil, and I dreaded when the, the truck would show up to fill the tank because it was so expensive. That was before the current inflation people are facing. That was before the carbon tax even existed. And Fury said, you've got to make sure that people aren't put into energy poverty. We're doing our best to move them off of it, but it's going to take a while. Please consider that. The Trudeau liberals said no. So the conservatives had an ad voiced by Pierre Polyev where he explained what the liberals were doing and said, contact your local, your, your liberal and new Democrat MP to tell them to vote for my motion. Of course, none of them did. The conservatives think that, that the liberals are vulnerable in Newfoundland on this issue, that they might be able to pick up some seats. Look, they, the conservatives win handily in Alberta. They win handily in Saskatchewan. They do well in Manitoba. They need to start picking up seats out in the East Coast and they think this is a winning issue for them. So it, it was uh, it, an interesting bit of strategy on a very small scale because there's not that many seats in Newfoundland. Brian, some in the mainstream media are saying that Conservative leader Pierre Polyev appears like he may not be media friendly. Now, a recent example is our former colleague David Aiken calling out Polyev for not informing the media about the Diwali ceremony, I believe, that Polyev recently participated in. Is Pierre Polyev not allowing the media in? What are you hearing? What's, what happened to transparency? Well, look, um, you don't get invited to everything that leaders go to. And Justin Trudeau goes to a lot of events that are not open to media. I cover Premier Doug Ford quite often. We don't hear about every event. He does have to be careful, though, that that doesn't become part of the narrative, Polyev meaning. He's got to make sure that that's not part of the the narrative. He skipped the parliamentary press gallery dinner. Guess what? I was a member of the gallery for more than 10 years. I never went. It, it wasn't my scene. It's not something that I, I wanted to do. Um, but, you know, you skip that. You end up in arguments with the media. You're constantly uh, slamming them. That's going to help you with your base of supporters. But I keep saying that what the conservatives need to do is win swing voters. Swing voters aren't going to be all jazzed about saying defund CBC and the mainstream media is the enemy. They might watch CBC. They might listening to the mainstream media. So that will help you with your base, but it won't help you with swing voters. So you've got to find that balance. And every party does of trying to keep your base engaged, but reach out to people who voted for the other guy last time, but are you know, not so impressed with them this time. You want them on your side come the next election. So that's the balance he's got to find. Brian, the inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act continues in our nation's capital. Last week, we heard testimonies that showed some dysfunction with the Ottawa Police Service and the response to the Freedom Convoy. So far, there's been a lot of finger pointing, but not much has really changed here, has it? Well, we found out that the city of Ottawa was incompetent, and so was their police force. Uh, they were the main response points for dealing with the Freedom Convoy, as I think we discussed last week. Once you get off Parliament Hill, once you step onto the sidewalk off the hill, that's City of Ottawa jurisdiction. That's the Ottawa Police Service jurisdiction. It's not the RCMP. It's not the federal government. And, you know, even today, they, they were uh, the Commission Council was examining one of the Ottawa Police uh, Service officers. And they would ask him questions like, did you know how many trucks were coming? No, no, we didn't know that. Okay, let's turn to page such and such of your notes. Uh, what does it say in your notes? And it would say how many trucks? Well, how many people were coming? Well, we didn't know that. Can we turn to page such and such of your notes? So they knew a lot of this. It was all in there. They chose to ignore it. It was an intelligence failure, as I said last week. It was a failure to plan, to anticipate. They could have allowed the Freedom Convoy to... Um, you know, have their demonstration to uh, even take some trucks up onto Wellington Street in front of Parliament Hill and not have it turn into what it turned into. Their fundamental failure of allowing so many trucks to show up and embed themselves in front of Parliament Hill led to the situation that we're in. You know, one of the shocking things we learned is how the Ottawa Police Service didn't realize how big the convoy was. You know, people from all across Canada coming in, hundreds and hundreds of people. And 
build its way up to thousands of people. Did the Ottawa police not watch the news, read a newspaper, even look into social media to understand how big this was going to be? It doesn't appear that they did because you and I knew this from covering it, but I've spoken to friends who aren't the media that kind of, you know, scrunch up their face and say, what, they didn't know? It was on TV news every night. It was in the newspaper every morning. It was on the radio all day. Or, you know, use the Google, use Facebook. <laughs> they were posting and, and they, they were completely unprepared. Um, they, they received briefings from the Ontario Provincial Police. We found that out. They received briefings from the RCMP, from other levels of government. They ignored it. They thought that this was going to be uh, a protest that would last Saturday and Sunday. By Monday at noon, everything would be cleaned up. Mm, that was not the case. That was never going to be the case. But as we find out more information, we find out that, you know, it wasn't just that they were being um, blind to what was going on or ignoring it, right? or, or not paying attention to it. They were outright ignoring it because they were told people are coming until all restrictions, COVID restrictions are lifted. That was in the notes of the officer that was testifying this morning. That was in the notes of other officers. They just decided, nah, we know better. You know, they'll be here Saturday and Sunday. We'll have the streets swept up and clean for Monday afternoon. Uh, that was never the plan. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, if we're looking to lay blame, it, it definitely has to be laid at the feet of the Ottawa Police Service for the most part in terms of uh, how this started out. But that's not the big question in the inquiry. The in big question is, was invoking the Emergencies Act justified? Yeah, let me ask you that. Was it, in fact, necessary to be invoked? Have you seen any evidence so far, Brian, that invoking the act was justified? No, mostly what I've seen is uh, incompetence by the Ottawa Police Service, uh, resentment of the help that they asked for by the, uh, from the RCMP and the Ontario Provincial Police. They asked for help. They asked for more officers. And yet, at every turn, they'd be asked, OK, great, we can send you more officers. What are you going to do with them? Who will they report to? Where will they stay? Because these were officers coming in from out of Ottawa. And you've got a bunch of the downtown hotels taken up by convoy protesters. Where are they going to stay? The Ottawa Police Service had no plan. And so eventually, officers, uh, senior officers from the OPP, from the RCMP, went in. And, and the, the local police were told by higher uh, authority politicians, you're going to have an integrated command. They resented that. They resented the, the help. They fought against it. All of that delayed what was going on. And, it, you know, we also found out that some, you know, they had these things called police liaison teams that would actually negotiate with the protesters, try and have good relations. Some of the senior officers actually didn't like that style of operation and fought against it. So we're just finding out that even uh, Brenda Lucky, the, there was a note from her. Uh, she's not testified yet, but there was, uh, I believe it was an email where she said, even hours before the Emergencies Act was invoked, that not all police tools had been used yet. So that would tell me, no, if all police tools hadn't been used, then there was no need because that's supposed to be why you invoke the act. There's no other way to deal with the situation. Well, the act, as we know, was invoked for politics. Now, Ontario Premier Doug Ford has been called to testify but he's instead challenging the subpoena, Brian. Is he not required to appear and testify? Well, that would depend on who you ask. And, um, you know, the Canadian Constitution Foundation, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and the lawyers representing Ottawa, downtown Ottawa residents and businesses, they want Ford to uh, appear. But the way that the Inquiries Act is written and the way this inquiry was set up, it only has the same jurisdiction as a civil court. And you can't compel a, an elected official like a premier, an MP, an MPP to testify in a civil proceeding like this if it relates to their job. So that will be argued out in court. Uh, you know, there's reasons that Ford won't want to testify uh, that are political. There's reasons that people want him to testify that are political. I'm struggling to find out what the the benefit of having Ford testify would be from a position of answering that fundamental question. Was it necessary to invoke the Emergencies Act? So I called up the Const uh, Canadian Constitution Foundation, spoke to one of their people, and they said, we want to know why Ford didn't use other emergency powers available to him. 
That's why they want him there. So that would speak to the issue of, you know, were there other options? But this is, of course, a federal inquiry, and the federal government invoked the act. You know, did they speak to the province about it? We don't know. But the prime minister is going to testify. A bunch of his ministers will. If they decide not to, they're in the same position as Ford, by the way. They don't have to, but they've volunteered that they're going to testify. So politically, this could end up looking very bad for Ford. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal.